I love, love it. All right, guys, welcome to the uh, to the staff happy half hour question and answer session for Virtual Overland Expo. Um, thank you all for being here. We've got uh, several questions from the interwebs and some that were generated from the staff. So just uh, introduce ourselves. I'm Zach Elsman. I'm Rachel Elsman. And we both, um, Rachel does a lot of the customer service for Overland Expo, a lot of the website work. Um, I do some of the social media and then the volunteers. Um, and we travel around in a short school bus, soon to be a full-size school bus. So we are kind of the weird outliers of the Overland Expo world. Um, let's go to Graham. Tell us a little about yourself and uh, how you got here. Uh, hi guys, I'm Graham. Um, been with Overland Expo since the very first one in 2008, whenever that was. Um, training director ever since then. I'm also a team member of 47P and I run the, the training area that does all the driver training and all of that sort of stuff. So driving, recovering, all that. Um, currently have currently seem to be in the business of collecting overland vehicles more than actually traveling since we're all, you know, not traveling. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on Land Rovers and Land Cruisers at the moment. Very cool. That's right. Speaking of Eva, tell us a little about yourself and how you got to this, uh, to this round table. Hey, I'm Eva and the motorcycle community ambassador, resident mixologist and occasional food and beverage director for Overland Expo. I've been with the company for four years now, I think, which is great. And um, I've been having a great time putting together the Virtual West event. This is awesome. And it's so great to see all your faces. Likewise. Anthony, tell us a little about yourself. Hey, I'm Anthony Sicola. I'm the sales director for Overland Expo, and I get to uh, hang out with all of our great exhibitors and uh, bring uh, all of our attendees uh, an awesome trade show every year. So that's a lot of fun. I've uh, been with Overland Expo since 2015. Wow. Um, so yeah, I just hit six years. And uh, I love the show. I love the community. And yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Very cool. Allison? Uh, yeah, so I have been uh, as part of Overland Expo uh, since 2013, um, 2014, somewhere around there. Uh, but I started attending Overland Expo in 2011 uh, when it was still in a motto. Uh, seeing some of Graham's fine work uh, in the vehicle and recovery classes. Um, but I am more uh, of a motorcyclist traveler um, and kind of prefer that mode of travel and exploring and uh, have ridden pretty much uh, a lot a lot of areas between Alaska and Argentina um, and a lot around the southwest in the US um, which is equally as beautiful um, and I am I take care of a lot of the programming um, and I don't know what else a lot <laughs> a lot a lot a little of everything <laughs> all very cool uh, Azure Last but not least. Hey guys, I'm Azure O'Neill. I'm Overland Expo's Director of Logistics. I ride a Honda Transalp and actually came to Overland Expo through my travels on that bike. I spent a couple of years or actually three or four years giving presentations before I transitioned to um, Overland Expo team member. And I've been working for the organization for three years now and have the best colleagues in the business. So. Cheers, happy to see you all today. Cheers to that. <laughs> all right, so now that we got that out of the way, um, let's start off with a user submitted question from Instagram. And Graham, you're gonna love this, uh, this handle. It was at Landy's and Gentleman wants to know what is, what is the consensus of the most epic Advi Moto route in the continental United States? So I'm going to default to Eva first, and let's make the rounds on the uh, the motorcycle women in our in our midst. The most epic ADV route. I mean, <laughs> how can you even narrow it down? I mean, I guess I'm biased, so anything out west is phenomenal just for the scenery and the beauty. I I guess I just I'm I'm gonna take the easy way out and I'm just gonna default to the backcountry discovery routes, right? These are a series of incredible off-road motorcycle and very often four-wheel drive passable routes through a bunch of the western states. There's 10 different routes now across the country. 
and they're just awesome. The Arizona one is incredible, and each one is really indicative of the motorcycle riding in that state. So if you're looking for great rides, just hunt down a BDR wherever you might be. I love it. What about you, Azure? What do you think? Um, to be completely honest, I haven't done that much ADV riding around the U.S., just a bit in the southwest. Um, White Rim Road um, in Canyonlands National Park is probably my top. Uh, for South America, the Lagunas route was, for me, just a, a camp miss. I absolutely, it was hard, uh, but worth every, every, uh, every teardrop and every bit of blood and sweat, too. Beautiful. What about you, Allison? Uh, there's a lot of really great roads um, along Washington and Idaho and uh, um, kind of going down into Montana and Wyoming. There's some really beautiful scenery back there, too. It's hard to pick one. Yeah, no kidding. Um, so that leads us into the next question, kind of a variation on that original one. Was uh, the most epic trip you've taken in the U.S. or, or the most exciting road you've traveled on? Uh, as you talked a little bit about South America. So where's everybody been? Let's start with Graham. What's your, what's your most epic road? Um, not constrained to, uh, to geographic boundaries. I'm going to have to say most epic sort of overall was crossing the Congo um, back in 2004, but that's been a while. Um, very muddy, very difficult, lots of winching, um, pretty epic. Uh, so I'm going to have to take several out of this, I'm afraid. Um, Camp Six Road in Belize, never managed to finish it. So that makes it epic. I have to go back and finish that one. Tried twice. I've only made it in 1.7 kilometers. Haven't made any further than that. Um, and then just for just sheer beauty and just for the love of deserts, um, we just did a trip out to Mauritania and uh, the route out to the Richard structure was just, it's, it's, it's mind-blowingly beautiful. So, and remote as all get out. So love it. Love it. What about you, Anthony? Wow. I don't know. Um, in the U.S., I haven't done very many epic, I guess, trips, uh, but, uh, but I, I really love the drive uh, through northern Arizona, through um, Valley of the Gods, and then up onto Cedar Mesa, and then up to Bears Ears. Um, I think that is probably one of the most amazing roads in the U.S., and, the, and all of the offshoots off of it. Um, um, where you can just disperse to camp really anywhere you want um, and go see amazing ruins and and you know you're in you're in cottonwood canyons it's incredible incredible spot um, the most I, I think the craziest thing that I've ever done was ride um, a bullet 500 from um, from Calcutta to um, uh, up to Darjeeling in India and um, and those roads are really super scary um, and and they often have waterfalls running through them and they often drop uh, a thousand feet off the off the edge into nothing and uh, there's no guardrails I don't even think guardrail is a word in India um, so yeah um, that was that was one of the most scary things that I've ever done and I would say most epic. Very cool speaking of trips um, what is the most uh, most used piece of equipment or most useful piece of equipment on your rig or on your on your moto? Um, we'll start with Allison here. What's one thing that you that you cannot leave home without on a trip? Um, oh wow, that's a really good question. I, I mean, I would almost have to say my camera, which I know is not motorcycle specific at all, but probably one of the things that I use the most often. I love it, Eva. What do you think? Gosh, I would have to say uh, tire repair kit, air compressor, and uh, reserve fuel bottle, because that's just those basic things that'll get you out of a pinch. <clears throat> you know, some steel stick, some JB Weld, <laughs> something, <laughs> something to put the broken bits back together when that happens in an unfortunate location. I mean, I think that's totally essential, like just those essentials. But you know, there's a lot of way more fun things that you can bring on a trip, like, you know, like tiny little flasks to keep your cocktail mix in, or um, I love those Revel twinkle lights that are on the wires. Good job, Graham. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, link, we'll link to that in the description so you can pick one of those up. I know where to buy them. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Azure, what's your, what's your go-to piece of gear? I think having a tank bag or like a, 
a go kit if you're in a in a car or whatever it um for me just being able to pull the essentials off of the bike really easily and um i really like moscow has a nice one the nomad um that has backpack straps so that's been super helpful if i need to you know want to go for a hike or i need to deal with you know border officials or whatever just pull all the important things off and not have to worry about it yeah agreed what about you anthony piece of gear you can't leave home without uh, um probably my refrigerator i have to be honest like I, I love to eat and i like to eat well when i'm outside so um i really wouldn't want to go anywhere without my refrigerator um but in terms of um in terms of equipment that i have on the on the truck um i mean i it's gonna sound weird but i like i just think a good set of tires is super important like and just making sure that you keep them in in, in good good working order and keep checking them and uh, make sure that they're i mean you can't go anywhere without tires so what do you think graham what's your essential piece of gear that you take with you uh, I'm just going to go, well, I, I was going to mention two things, but uh, Anthony already got the fridge. So that's obviously afternoon beverages, right, in the fridge. Uh, morning beverages, it's got to be the Kelly kettle. It's got to be a way to boil water, make tea. So, uh, yeah. I love it. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, we had a question from at Drewlos, D-R-E-W-L-O-S, asked us, um, it's my first time attending Overland Expo. What do you guys recommend bringing and seeing? So let's start with Allison on what do you recommend as some tips for a first time Overland Expo attendee? Who um, uh, take your time. Like you're going to want to see everything, um, but it, there's so much to see at Overland Expo that it's hard to take it all in, even there for being there for three days. Um, between all of the exhibitors, uh, like at West, we have over 300 exhibitors, um, which is hard to even see all of them um, at the show, plus tons of programming, whether you're taking you know, classes or whatnot. I, I would definitely stop um, by the theater and see some presentations, because uh, that's gonna just inspire you to, to go out and explore. What about you, Eva? Any recommendations for a newbie? Man, I think the most important thing is just talking to as many people and meeting as many people as possible. I think ever the first time I went to Overland Expo was out at Mormon Lake, whatever that was, six or eight years ago for the first time. And I had just moved to Flagstaff. And the people that I met there between staff members and exhibitors and travelers just changed my perspective on so many things. I really feel like um, just meeting people who, you know, pack their trucks up and you know, rented out their houses for a few months and hit the road was just like the most inspiring thing. And I feel like there are so many great presentations and so many great teachers and so many people who will just inspire your next great adventure. I would just say, talk to everybody. And you know, a great place to do that is at happy hour at the bar because the cocktails are great and everybody is there and people in the overlanding community are so approachable and love sharing their stories. So just ask questions, share a drink with somebody and you know, get inspired for your next adventure. Very cool. What do you think, Graham? What are your recommendations for uh, for a new person at Overland Expo? Um, I'm just going to have to say buy an experience ticket so that you can come and see us in the Camel Trophy area. Because yeah. that's the best part, really. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Anthony? I know Graham just stole yours. But... <laughs> it is the best part if you get to go see Graham and Dunk like close up and learn from them because they're awesome. Um, I'm, I don't know, you know, I think I'm going to be pragmatic here. Like, I think one of the best things to bring to Overland Expo for your first time is a bicycle. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just to be able to, to ride between camp and the, uh, and the exhibitor area and, um, you know, just lock it up and, and you're good to go. I mean, it's kind of nice to have that. Um, bring a water bottle um, because it's at elevation and it's often hot and windy and dry and like you'll want water. So get water, bring water. Um, things to see. Well, I mean, I'd be silly if I didn't say the exhibitor area. Um, so yeah, I mean, bring, uh, you know, save up your money though. Like bring, bring, <laughs> bring an open wallet, I guess I should say. <laughs> um, because, uh, because the exhibitors have so many incredible show specials 
and like you can often get things for I mean honestly like sometimes you can get them for like 25 30 percent off of off of retail um and so yeah save your money and bring that with you it's <laughs> a lot of fun and I'll echo what what Eva said as well like it's just meeting people um I mean that's really the most important important part of the show uh I, in my in my eyes yeah agreed Azure what do you think uh, dovetailing off of what Anthony said, sunscreen, you know, since we're at high elevation, I've definitely made that mistake a couple of times, forgetting that. Um, whatever clothing you need to be comfortable from like 20 degrees all the way up to like 85, because that can happen in one day. Um, and a bottle of something to share at the campground, it's non alcoholic or alcoholic, but it's a, it's a great way to just be able to wander around and, and meet people. Like you guys said, that's the, the best part of it. Um, in terms of what not to miss, I think one of my favorite parts of the show every year is the uh, charity presentation and raffle. Uh, just some of the most inspiring people I've ever had the pleasure to know in my life, um, you know, get up there on stage and share stories that uh, just out of this world. So definitely don't miss that one. Yeah, agreed. I think probably one of our favorite, not probably, one of our favorite parts of Overland Expo is the people. Um, between the staff, the volunteers, the, the vendors on site, the exhibitors, everybody. I mean, there's a reason that we keep coming back every year to do this thing, other than the fact that you can get 30% off of sweet gear. Um, the people are fantastic. I think that's something that every, every event, every location just seems to keep getting better. So I can agree with that across the board. Um, Okay, this is an interesting one. So how did you get into overlanding and what was your first overlanding trip? Let's start with Graham. Um, I was born into it. <laughs> my first overland trip was when I was six and my parents threw me in the back of a Land Rover and took me uh, into the Kalahari Desert. So cool. <laughs> uh, after that, it, there wasn't really an option. <laughs> I should have I should have asked Graham last. I'm sorry, guys. Next question. Next question. You know, I don't even want to answer this question now. <laughs> so I'll bring it back down to back down to earth. I wouldn't have told you. I didn't know what overlanding was until I was already doing it. You know, camped as a kid. I think Rachel can probably share that sentiment too. A lot of car camping as a kid, but really got into it as a young adult when I could afford a four wheel drive and a tent. And so getting out into Northwest Arkansas, uh, Central Arkansas, parts of Oklahoma, um, not your typical overlanding destinations by any stretch, but realizing that to get to some of the best, you know, hiking, biking, uh, rafting, paddling, stuff like that, you had to have a vehicle that was capable and kind of shaped into what we, what we have learned to, to love a little bit. Anthony, what about you? Where did you, uh, where did you cut your teeth? Wow. Um... I mean, I guess I was overlanding before it was called overlanding. Um, it was called camping. And, um, and I had a Toyota truck when it was just called a Toyota truck. It wasn't anything cool like a Tacoma or anything like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we used to go out in California all the time, um, back roads kind of through the, through the Sierras and on the Eastern Sierra, in the Eastern Sierras. Um, and just do a lot of dispersed camping out in that, out in that area. Um, I guess my first, like after I built out my Land Cruiser, I think our first really long trip um, was the Mojave Road um, going out to Overland Expo in 2012, I think it was. And, um, and we took about three days, uh, got stuck a bunch, um, had a really good time. And uh, yeah, it was, that was, that kind of sold me on and especially having a lot of friends that are in the in on the same trail with me at the same time it was it was a good time nice what about you azure where'd you where'd you start i was driving around australia by myself and met this really attractive dutch guy who'd ridden his motorcycle overland from holland to australia and he invited me to jump on the back of his bike and take a trip down the middle of the country and at that point, like the center of Australia was the only place that they didn't think women should be traveling by themselves. So I was kind of like, well, this is a no brainer. This will be a great adventure. Um, it was a little bit of a circus. I had never spent that much time on a motorcycle. And we'd been dating for like probably about a month. Uh, but I remember probably like 
five days into the trip, we were somewhere in the middle of the desert, like riding during the day was super hot. And I woke up like, and started crying in the morning. And I was like, I just, I don't think I can do this. Like, we're gonna have to find it, find an airport I can fly out of. And Rule was like, you know, what's, what's the problem? And I was like, I'm just in so much pain. And like 10 minutes later, here's this guy I've been dating for like a month, putting diaper rash cream on my entire backside. And I was like, well, this is definitely a different lifestyle. But <laughs> obviously it worked out because we spent the next six years traveling overland by motorcycle. Yeah, no kidding. I love that. That's a great story. What a love story. <laughs> Well, TMI, but you know. <laughs> I love it. What about you, Eva? Um, man, I guess I, I, I have to kind of put myself in the same category as Anthony. I didn't realize it was called overlanding. Like when I was uh, 18, I got my first Toyota pickup truck, and it was just a Toyota pickup truck. <laughs> like it was a 1990 Toyota pickup truck, and just started rambling around in that thing. Like, and I always considered myself to be a dirtbag climber in my early 20s. And it was just just traveling to get to the crags, me and the dogs in the back, and just going for weeks and months on end. And you know, when you're out looking for rock climbing destinations, you get very remote. You get way far out there, and that's sort of like that spirit of overlanding. Um, I got my first motorcycle sometime in my early 20s, and I have no idea why. I just one day I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to go buy a motorcycle, and it was a beautiful 1979. CB750, a Honda. I had no idea what I had gotten my hands on. I like had no clue. I was just like, oh, it was really cheap. It was pristine. It's cherry. I, I wish I still had it. And I strapped my little duffel bag on the back of that thing and started tooling all over the place on that too. And I know it's not an adventure motorcycle traditionally, but you know, I've been rambling around mostly in the United States on uh, in either two or four wheels for the majority of my adult life. And and I guess it all kind of falls into the overlanding category because as long as it has that spirit of adventure, I feel like that's that's what we're doing, right? We're just doing it because it's awesome, because it's amazing to go see more rad stuff. And it's just kind of, you know, I think it just gets into your blood. It's just in your soul. Agreed. What about you, Allison? I would definitely dovetail off that. And if I could just say, because my, my intro was really, really short, so I'm going to jump in with one more. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so back in uh, 2004, my wife and I drove from London to Cape Town, and then when we got back to the U.S., that's sort of when overlanding was taking off in the U.S., and so um, just so all of you are aware, um, I did write the definition of overlanding on Wikipedia, so if anybody's asking where it all came from, it's, it's right here on this Zoom call. Graham <laughs> with another mic drop. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm Bye. <laughs> All right, Allison, follow that up with, uh, awesome. with how you That's a hard one to follow up. Um, but uh, so I have a very specific occasion in which I remember being introduced to overlanding. And like, I have been a motorcyclist for most of my life. I had, you know, same thing. I started out with CB um, 400s, 550s, 750s. Uh, when I lived in San Francisco, moved down to LA, um, you know, I've been camping my entire life. And so I was camping one weekend in Joshua Tree, um, which absolutely love that place. And a motorcyclist um, was kind of doing rounds. Like we had set up count, uh, camp, we were car camping at the time and, and uh, he was doing rounds. And, and so like, I nudged to my uh, husband at the time, like, you know, you got to go invite him over. Um, because like looking at his panniers, he was well traveled. And, you know, had, you can tell like, he just had some stories to him. So we invited him to the campfire and, and heard his tale like he lives in Alaska, you know, paints during summer, travels the um, southwest during the winter months when it's temperate. Um, and so that was kind of like my light bulb moment of I can do something like this. Like I can combine my two loves of motorcycling and camping and go exploring on them. And beyond just the weekend out of a back of a truck, um, you know, it's, it's actually like, you know, taking that journey where it's, it's not a still destination, but an actual um, adventure in that regard where, 
you continue on and, and use the vehicle as the means to see all there is to explore. So yeah, it was changed my life. And how long was it before you got the bike after that? Um, so uh, that was in 2009 and I bought a KLR shortly after that. <laughs> Um, okay, so yes, um, I think it was, so in 2009, um, I ended up buying a KLR. I got a divorce. Uh, shortly after that, I started traveling the Southwest during my summers. The summer after that, it was Alaska. And then the year after that, it was all the way down to Argentina. So kind of snowballed into this massive motorcycle trip. Dig it. So I know that everybody has probably done at least one of those bucket lists, just epic trips. Um, it seems like we're in good company with that. But where is the one place that you want to go that you haven't been or the place you want to go back to? If you had to pick one trip, um, you have, you know, a month left to live. What's the one trip you choose and where do you go? Start with uh, Anthony. Um, you know, I still want to do like the Dalton Highway um, up through Alaska. I also want to do, um, oh man, no, I can't, it's, the name is escaping me. What's the one through the Yukon Territories that goes to? Um, the Dempster. The Dempster, yeah. So I also want to do the Dempster. Um, and, uh, and I want to dip my toes in the, uh, in the Arctic Ocean. So that's one of that's one of the things I want to do. I also want to get back up to um, to Banff in uh, BC um, because the last time I was exploring up there, there were so many fires that you couldn't see ten feet in front of your face. So, yeah. Agreed. Yeah, we we got cheated. We were supposed to be like right now after after Expo, we were going to be um, going to Alaska and doing the doing the Dalton Highway. So we're we feel a little bit cheated. But uh, we'll get there next year. 2021 is, is Groundhog Year. Yes. <laughs> Allison, what about you? What's your, your dream locale? Ooh, um, I, I, I got to say, I want to venture into uh, kind of South Africa and Southern Africa. Um, I, it, that's next on my bucket list. I really want to go see some awesome wildlife, especially giraffes. Giraffes are really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Eva dream trip i have been dying to get to southeast asia for years and for some reason or another it always gets derailed this year for obvious reasons um but yeah hopefully i'm thinking 2021 southeast asia on a tiny motorbike i love it what about you azure i know you've been all over the world where are you going next so many places left to see um mongolia definitely at the top of the list um who knows when that will happen, given all of the things. Um, and then, then I'd love to do a big trip in, through Africa. Hi, Graham, what's your, uh, your dream trip? Um, I'd love to do the Silk Road all the way across Asia and into Mongolia. And in general terms, I just want to cross all the deserts in the world, so there's that. <laughs> Very cool. So probably our last question here, unless anybody has any other questions to add, but uh, what is, so if somebody's getting into overlanding, they're a first timer, they've never camped, what is your recommendation for like a step-by-step -step process to get into it? What would you suggest? Let's start with Eva. Um, be a weekend warrior to, to get your feet wet. There's nothing wrong with heading out into a location that's not too far away, that's not too intimidating. Um, just to test out your gear, test out your systems, and build your comfort level step by step. I would say you don't need, I mean, or what the heck, jump right in, sell your house, and move into your truck. Do that too, whatever. Mm -hmm. But if if you just have a weekend, take those little opportunities to develop your comfort zone and build your skills. I love it. What about you, Allison? Any recommendations for a for a first time first time overlander? Um, I would say brush up on your driving skills. And I say driving skills just in general, so uh, on-road as well as off-road, because I, I know that we have to spend a lot of time on-road to get to our off-roads, and so doing that safely, um, I think, is key. And also, you know, take some training at Overland Expo and, and get some awesome off-road skills with, with uh, Graham and, and Duncan. Yeah, agreed. Or Dart. 
Or dart, absolutely. If or you're dart, on, true. I would yeah. have awesome motorcycle trainers as well. Very cool. Azure, any recommendations for a first time, first time overlander? Um, I think getting comfortable with basic maintenance for your vehicle is really important. Um, just kind of, I think it takes a lot of anxiety away um, when you kind of can figure out how to change your tire and huge, um, you know, unknown. It's just kind of like, all right, no big deal. I can, I can handle this or, or patch a flat or do whatever. So just kind of figuring out like the, the basics for what if. Yeah, agreed. It's amazing how much confidence will come in the other aspects of traveling whenever you can conquer your, your machine easily and everything else just seems a little, a little silly to, to tackle whenever you can do all that, right? Exactly. Anthony, what about you? What's a uh, recommendation for a first timer? Wow. Um, I think nothing beats just getting out there. Um, that said, like you don't want to go do anything that um, is going to put you in danger. So um, I kind of echo what everyone else is saying, go take some training of some sort. Um, I know a good place. Um, it's called Overland Expo. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, when I kind of started, I thought I knew what I was doing and uh, took the Overland Experience classes uh, one year, 20, 2012, I think was my first year taking those classes. And um, I was amazed what I didn't know. Um, so uh, it's just, you know, it's important. Um, yeah, just be prepared. I love it. I think that probably we can all agree that you never stop learning on traveling in general, much less off-road with the obstacles that we face. But Graham, what do you have for a, uh, a recommendation for a first time overlander? Um, I'm gonna sort of, it, I think people, Everybody else has, has mentioned it very well, um, but I'm just going to reiterate, I think, that getting training is, is, a, is the best place to start and talking to people at Overland Expo, learning what people have done, getting inspired by different trips is, is a great way to do it. Be a little bit careful with the um, learning off YouTube because um, there's a lot of misinformation on YouTube. So um, get, get your information from reputable sources and there's nothing better than going to Overland Expo, I think, and actually seeing what is out there, what people are doing, and going, going, getting the experience package and getting trained in everything you can. So that's that's definitely the best place to start because packing you can pack an infinite amount of stuff up here, and you can't pack an infinite amount of stuff in your car. So. <laughs> Yeah, and that's getting into some gross vehicle weight talk that I, I think we could probably avoid for this one. We don't have enough time on Probably this. should, yeah. Let's <laughs> dig into all of that. Cool. I want to thank you guys so much for being a part of this and for, uh, for joining us for Virtual Overland Expo. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you very soon at Overland Expo West in July. Um, but thank you. And can you guys give me like a cheesy wave with your drinks? and just? <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everybody.